ಗಂಗನಾಧಿಪತೇ ನಮಃ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸೊ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫೋರ್ಥ್ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ಅಜತವಾರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿವಾರ್ತವಾರ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲನೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ might lead to some confusion like what's really going on here what is this about you know it might be a little confusing but scripture does it all the time i mean bhagavad gita ay 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 shankara acharya in his commentary on bhagavad gita goes through it <laughs> really with a fine tooth comb and sometimes krishna is switching ontologies in the middle of a verse you know because he's speaking to everybody look at who's present there who is hearing on the battlefield it was like everybody in the world you know or every type of person in the world and krishna was addressing them all with all the different viewpoints on uh, the absolute truth but it takes an expert to parse it all out tease it all out it's like just you know go with the parts that that speak to you that make sense to you and, and just ignore the rest you can spend the rest of your life on this puzzle you know so if krishna is trying to protect arjuna and the pandavas and everybody really by speaking the absolute truth in many faceted ways ramana is also doing the same thing here in a, maybe a more limited way because he's speaking remember the the first verse huh he's speaking just to the ripe aspirants the tivra adhikaris those who know actually <laughs> what it's all about although they may not have completely reached there but uh, they got it and it's just a matter of time till they become atitivra <laughs> like ramana so given that that's the background or this is the person who is speaking okay uh so far in this first chapter he's been flip-flopping back and forth you know? so why why so here comes the verse that explains it fear not on seeing this empty world which appears as a dream in the sleep of self forgetfulness this imaginary and bondage causing world picture projected on the background of the dark dense mind will not stand in the light of supreme knowledge satchitananda you listening maharaj <laughs> my friend satchitananda maharaj my oldest friend he uh he pointed this out to me he said yeah we're all satchitananda at the root isn't it and whether we accept uh, the theory of the soul and the eternal identity of swarupa bhakti uh rasa or uh ishta devata uh or uh eternal identity or, or individuality as the soul huh? whether we believe in that or we see that as a stage on a larger quest you know um it doesn't really matter this is still true still true remember he's starting from those words because we see the world because we see the world the world is something other that breeds fear just because there's something other huh and it seems to be in control not us not i huh 
Oh my God. <laughs> what to do, right? So some people think that just unceremoniously declaring themselves God is enough. But Ramana disagrees. He says, he says, fear not. These are the words of a hero, a protector. And this is the actual mood of this whole chapter. Okay, we see the world and it's scary. But fear not. Fear not. Uh, because this world is just a, a crazy making appearance. Don't take it so serious. Okay? Don't look at it like it's so, it's real, like it's the only thing there is. There is something else. Even the Buddha, who famously, you know, sometimes decried the very idea of rebirth, you know, uh, he said that there is another birth, there is another life for most of us. Only those in the final stages of the path really get the moksha. Everybody else is still practicing. And we have to continue that practice until, until it sets. We don't know when that's going to happen. So it's not up to us. Huh? That's all right. But that is the way it is. So we accept that. But others don't. They want to be in control. And so they struggle against the natural control of God and fate or karma or whatever you want to call it, destiny, and cause themselves needless pain. So this shlok, this verse, is actually telling us, like, chill out. Don't be so attached to this appearance. Huh? Why? Well, he's going to use the rest of the book to explain why. <laughs> How to transcend this uh, mind uh, overtaking appearance, like Kalima, you know, this horrific, scary appearance of the world, or uh, the universal form in Bhagavad Gita that made everyone so afraid. Why? Because it reminds us that we have to die. Uh, it reminds us that we're suckers. We're suckers because we bought the con that the world gives us, huh? That, yeah, hang out here, man, relax, enjoy. Everything's cool, right? Either you're just going to go to heaven, like on a rubber stamp, just because you're such a great guy, or <laughs> there is no nothing after death, so it doesn't matter anyway. Just do whatever you want. People love that. Uh, it makes them think they're in control, and maybe they are, you know, in a little bit of control, right? Like the, the, the helmsman, the, the guy who steers the boat. He has a feeling of being in control, but actually how much is he in control? No matter how much he wiggles the, the rudder, he is still in the boat. Similarly, those of us who like to exercise our will and convince ourselves and others that we are doing something, maybe we're being creative, you know, or whatever. Um, we're doing that because we can. But why? Why are we investing so much in such a bad deal, you know? If I had a, a 401k that just randomly lost all your money, that wouldn't be a very good investment plan, would it? I mean, even if you could start up again, you know? Even, <laughs> even if there is rebirth, right? Should I really be like putting so much energy and effort into this tube 
this vortex. You know, uh, this fabrication. It's just a shell. It's just a tool. It's just an interface. Respect it and use it and take care of it as such, you know? But it's not who we are. Who we are is pure consciousness. So Ramana says, and I love the way he packs this whole thing, this whole point into a succinct little nougat. <laughs> when we see the world as real in itself, we suffer and we become prey to rebirth and so on. But when we see it as an appearance in Brahman, then we're free. Same world, same seeing. Huh? Remember the story of the couple in the temple? He, she was having a, an emotional orgasm and he was like checking his watch, you know, when are we going to be out of here? So two people can have the exact same experience or the same person at different times and it can be totally great or horrible. <laughs> We never know. That's the thing. We never know. So why should we subject ourselves to this? You know? I mean, if we have any self-respect. You know, you got to have self-respect. <laughs> My friends in New Jersey would say, you know. you got to respect yourself, man. You know? Stick up for yourself. So... Uh, in the same way, we have to be able to draw the boundaries and say, is this really worthwhile? Is this attachment? Is this promise? Is this engagement? Is this attachment or whatever? Possession or whatever. This designation, this role, this title. Or that. Is it worth the loss of freedom and autonomy? Am I selling myself too cheap to the world? You know? Look, we're all going to get the results of our prarabdha karma anyway. So whatever karma this body was created with is going to happen. And what we do in this lifetime or how we take what happens in this lifetime determines the karma in the next life if we have one if we don't get liberation, moksha, in this life. So what we have to do then is to clear out all the possible causes of a dharma going against the flow of what the universe wants to happen. Huh? Um, for those of you who have been with us for a while, check back to the videos on uh, vortex theory vortex theory in the Buddhist teaching. Fascinating stuff. Okay. The whole universe is just created out of nothing <laughs> by the momentum of a, of a picture, by moving information. It's, it's crazy. It's just a vibration. Um, <laughs> it really is at the most fundamental, you know, subatomic level or whatever. So what can I say? I'm almost out of time. If we look at this creation, this world, that appears and disappears each day, <laughs> if we look at it as it's real, we get in trouble, we suffer. If we look at it as this is just like a virtual thing, then we have the opportunity to become aware of our awareness. This is the ultimate practice. This is the pathless path. This is because it's just it's no path. You're just turning around. And looking at, instead of looking at the world as the world, you look at it as a, a reflection 
in your consciousness, which is you, of course. Either a reflection or a projection. If you're still maintaining a mind, there will also be a projection. <laughs> like a rainbow over, over the ocean, right? It's the, the ocean is Brahman, and the waves are various phenomena in the world, right? Then our projection would be sort of like a rainbow in the sky over the ocean, right? Which has absolutely no impact on the ocean whatsoever. <laughs> but we may give it great meaning, great significance. Oh, look at that beautiful rainbow, all this stuff, right? So that's okay, you know, if you like that kind of stuff. Yeah. But <laughs> what's really happening is it's just a refraction of the light. And similarly, what we call the mind is just a refraction of our intelligence through this body and brain and all this stuff. And we don't know what we're really seeing, you know. Reality is such that it depends more on the quality of your senses and the quality of your attention than on, you know, what's really out there. You get what I'm talking about? It's not about what you're looking at. It's about how you are looking. So if you look in a certain way, you'll see a certain way. Huh? If you go into the world all full of desires, lust and hatred and anger and whatever, and all this energy, you know, it's going to become reflected back at you and you'll see a world that looks pretty much like you, you know all running around in competition for sense objects and all this kind of stuff. But if you go into the world without desires and just be willing to wait until the universe reveals what it wants to do and then just go along with it, like, uh-huh, yeah, boss, you know, things change. You, you don't anymore cause yourself needless suffering by going up against the universe. Huh? This is called surrender. <laughs> Sharanagati in Ananya Bhakti. Surrender to the self. Okay, so everything we're talking about here is in the scriptures, it's in the old books, and it's in Ramana's books, which are quite contemporary. And he has the advantage of expressing it to us in the terms that we think of it. So we're going to go on now from, from here to the end of the chapter on this theme, that this is an heroic uh, work, expressing Shiva as Dakshinamurti, uh, sitting on the south-facing side and protecting his students with his ultimate teaching of silence. After vanquishing the demon of doubt by his well-chosen words. So, I mean, this, this fits Ramana <laughs> to a T, you know. His ashram even sits on the south side of the hill. Anyway, so by following in his footsteps, however imperfectly, by just trying to understand his view the way he looks at things uh, it forms the basis of a practice that eventually leads us to the Ajatta platform. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Aum.